us in terms of our go-to-market on the market part uh, was really get out of the building, get out of the building. And that meant going and seeing your customers from day one and understanding what do they need, what are the pain points. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first Meet the Entrepreneurs event. Uh, for the year, and this one is a little bit different. Uh, if you're very accustomed to Meet the Entrepreneurs, you'll notice that our setup is very different this year. We usually do rounds, but we've had a very faithful group, and it's still a packed room, as you can all see. If you're not so used to Meet the Entrepreneurs, um, we run a little bit longer. Uh, it goes until about 7.30, and we have a reception afterward with a cash bar and snacks. Uh, our focus this evening is on the cleantech group, and or um, or our senior advisor for cleantech, Tom Rand, is going to be moderating. And Tom has been active in the cleantech sector, both as a venture capitalist and from a policy perspective, um, for quite some time now. And he's had table-pounding discussions about climate change since he was 12, so he's very versed in this area. And I'm quoting him, I'm not making this up. Um, just a shout out to our NORCAT Innovation Factory and Haltech partners who are joining us by webcast. Thank you for joining us and for being as faithful as our very large group here. And um, we're also joined by our panelists, Henry Chung from Revelo Bikes, who is our 2012 um, Upstart Competition winner, Robert Wong from AgriNeo, and Chris Reed from Energent. And Tom will give us a bit more background and information about, those pe about them. Stamp cards, uh, we do stop stamping cards at 6.15, uh, so anyone who comes in after that, uh, or if you forgot to get your card stamped, um, then nobody's going to be there past 6.15. So I won't take up any more time. I'm going to invite Tom and our panelists to join us. Um, welcome to Mars, everybody. I'm sure you've all been here before. And we can't have NORCAT on the website without saying hi to our good friend Don Duval. So wherever Don is, hello. <laughs> before we get, I invite the panelists up. Uh, you are all either entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs. And one of the things that we try to do at Mars is ensure that we network and ensure that we have you know, venture capitalists talking to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to entrepreneurs and banks to pharma and clean tech to IT and yada, 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 yada. So before we start, we're going to do a quick icebreaker. So it's like when you go to a musical and suddenly they turn around and they ask you to sing along. Well, this is that part. It won't be long and it, it will be fairly painless. But I would like you to, to take a few minutes and I want you to ask three questions of the neighbors to your left and right. And if you're on the edge of an aisle, reach across the aisle or go behind you. But at least two people. Ask three questions. Very simple. Um, why do you want to be an entrepreneur is one. What idea do you have, if any? And what is the first step you're going to take to implement that idea as an entrepreneur. Why be an entrepreneur? What's your idea? What's the first step you're going to take? Talk amongst yourselves five minutes. <laughs> Fabulous. I'm glad uh, we dived into that exercise with such enthusiasm. Um, so now I'm going to invite our panel up to join us. Uh, Chris Reed, President and CEO of Energent. Henry Chong, Founder and CEO of Revelo Bikes, which I think we've got one right here, don't we? And of course, uh, Rob Wong, President and CEO, uh, COO of AgriNeo. So why don't you guys come on up and take whatever seat you want. I'll take this guy right here. I think our lav mics are on. Yeah. Good. So I promised these guys to save my really awkward questions for somewhere in the middle after we're all relaxed. Is that right, Chris? Absolutely. Um, but because a lot of us don't know you, why don't we start out, I mean, just sort of give two or three minutes on where you came from in terms of your background into this company, how you got your idea. I mean, you know, an apple fell on your head and you suddenly thought there's a market for gravity or something. Where the idea came from um, and, and, of course, what that idea is. What, what is it that you do? And we'll just give a quick two or three minute intro. And maybe we'll start right here on my right. Sure. Um, hi, it's good to see everyone here. Um, I was just in your seat probably two years ago. And, um, yeah, I, I sort of made a, a midlife change. I, I went to study industrial design and, uh, at OCAD University. And uh, my graduation thesis project two years ago was the Life Bike. And uh, I um, ended up winning a bunch of uh, industrial design awards. And I, I decided to come in and check out what it was like to learn to become an entrepreneur. And uh, ended up winning the Mars Upstart competition. So from that, I started Revelo Bikes. The mission of Revelo Bikes is to uh, create a revolutionary personal electric transportation. And our first offering is the Life Bike, which is the ultralight 
compact electric bike uh, for urban commuters to allow you to commute easily and uh, you know have a good time commuting from A to B without breaking sweat. So uh, that's my story. I think my partner Murray McKay was caught riding one of those in front of the security desk a few months ago and was chastised. And we said, this is a Mars winner, darn it. <laughs> they let him go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Well, uh, yeah, so uh, Agri-Neo, I'll get into it, is in agriculture. I could not have come from a more different background. I started my career as a management consulting with, with Bain and Company, working with big companies, trying to help them you know, do things more efficiently, save on costs, how to grow. Great experience. but. While I was at Bain, I worked on a few organizations that um, tried to do multiple things, not only achieve a financial impact, but also do good, whether that was environmental or social or both. And that really got me excited. So when the opportunity came about to join Agri New, I jumped on it. So what do we do? Uh, we help farmers produce more food that's safer for all of us to consume in an environmentally sustainable manner. So the way we do that is we work on really interesting novel chemistry whether that's biochemicals, biologicals, or plant extracts. All of that helps farmers essentially increase yield, but it's better than the conventional chemicals that they're currently using in terms of performance, and also better for the environment and for all of us in terms of the food that we eat. So uh, our, our products are all along the food chain. Uh, we help to protect the seed. We also use it in the field to protect the crops and also in the post-harvest situation. So yeah, excited to be here. And, and meet all of you. And where did that idea come from? Yeah, sorry, good question. So I'm not the technical guy, so uh, it wasn't me in a, a lab dreaming it up. Um, we, one of my colleagues from Bain and good friend who, who runs Agronia with me, uh, his father is actually part of a group of angel investors that provided our first round of financing. This group actually has a lot of experience and expertise investing in science-based companies. Uh, they funded Agronia, our uh, director of product development has an extensive background in industrial biochemistry. That was his past life, focused not in agriculture, but similar sort of chemical and formulation experience. Came up with a few of our first technologies, and here we are trying to commercialize it. Great. Yeah. yeah. Chris. OK, well, my background is uh, in, uh, across a span of companies. I spent 20 years with Honeywell in uh, industrial automation and control, both here and in the US. Then I uh, actually moved to a small company environment, ran a computational fluid dynamics company, which was uh, actually one we wanted to sell, and uh, did so to ANSYS out of Pittsburgh. And at just about that time, I, uh, I actually am not the founder of Energent, but I was recruited by the founders and the board to, um, to join Energent. That was late 2009. And uh, it was a startup at the time, and we're still uh, early stage. But we're a mathematical modeling and analytics company. You may have heard the term big data. Uh, we essentially do modeling and analytics in real time for energy management. Uh, the analogy is, is uh, like a finance person would use Oracle or SAP. They can see what the, what the system tells them in terms of their plan and how they're doing in actuality. And with that level of insight, they can uh, optimize the financial performance of their company. We're, we're that for energy. Uh, so we're out of Waterloo, Ontario. We're very active in the Ontario uh, energy market, including uh, what Ontario is doing in smart grid. We have some very groundbreaking technology in that. But the bulk of our business day to day is with utilities and um, end user customers directly. Um, to your question, Tom, about where did the idea come from, it's, a, I think, a classic example of, of how things get started. The founders originally solved a problem for General Motors. Um, and in doing so, realized that this is a problem that many other companies probably faced as well. So out of, out of that initial problem solution for GM came a commercialization of the technology. And today, you know, we're at over 350 sites across North America. So that's a pretty broad, broad spectrum. I and mean, we have big utility customers over there. We have, I take it, it's farm, individual farmers, industrial farmers? Yeah, large scale commercial farms. Large scale commercial mm -hmm. farms, so similar scale utilities. And then is it retail or are you going through channels? How is your bike going to market? What's the? Well, right now, um, we're just uh, finishing up the uh, production uh, prototype and 
our first uh, entry into the market will probably be online and through specialized retailers, because right now what we have is a pretty much custom offering. Um, the reason why I invented the life bike in the first place is because the, uh, the um, market space for electric bikes is, is moving very quickly. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, sales basically doubled in one year. Um, but there, it's, it's just quickly gaining traction. And I noticed that there was a, a need in the market to, to fill, uh, to bring more awareness of electric bikes as a technology and as a clean technology. Because a lot of the bikes that we have in the marketplace kind of are, are, are coming from a China-centric infrastructure. We needed something that worked better in cities like Toronto. Uh, so um, as far as the... Yeah, so your customers, is, we're going sort of big to small customers. Yours right. are in progress, obviously, but it's a retail touch that you're looking for? How are you, how, well, what's your vision? Uh, the vision is for this it is a to go be... go to market question, Sure, right? sure. Yeah. I mean, the vision ultimately is to have it as a uh, general um, mass market, uh, internationally used product. But uh, I know that that's going to take some, you know, jumping over some hurdles. But in the initial step, in the e-market space, there's a lot of um, hunger for new innovation. It's, it's such a sort of uh, emerging field. It's easier for a, uh, someone like myself to be a little more agile and offer something a little bit off-center uh, that might offer uh, a better value proposition. So in our case, uh, we're among the lightest e-bikes in the world. Uh, we've got a chainless design. Um, it's, it's direct drive. It's a direct drive hybrid, and it's, and it's very portable. So in terms of uh, fitting into the infrastructure and lifestyles of people, um, I think it'll, it'll close, closely um, relate to the way people live, say, in the downtown core. Um, so um, hopefully that answers your no, question. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I know it's a bit unfair because I can't ask you know, Chris or Rob to, to do a demo. But are we, are are we going to see you on that bike doing a little tour around the room? <laughs> sure. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask that, but maybe we'll, we'll save that for the end. But if we can, I'd like to see a little tour of this bike at some point. Um, so yeah, this, the go-to-market strategy. So can you talk a little bit about how you're doing it but, and also maybe differentiate that first customer from your nth customer and where you are in that process and, and, and how you got that first difficult customer? I mean, did you literally knock on a door? Did you, were you at a trade show? How did you sell it to them? Was it a demo? Talk a little bit about that, that entry point and then maybe how you're moving through uh, uh, down, the, down the process a little bit. Let's start with you. Sure. Oh, Chris, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, you know, again, GM being the first, uh, the, the, uh, the fit, as it were, was largely industrial in the beginning. And so, uh, and also a direct sales model uh, in terms of going to market. Um, a very, very um, um, new technology and, and uh, new approach to energy management at that time. It was 2007. And so um, the uptake in the industrial sector was uh, fairly slow. Uh, for a variety of reasons. One, nobody was really familiar with this type of approach, so it was, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of missionary work required to, uh, to establish the um, value proposition and, and the benefits that would uh, come from it. So and what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by missionary work? Are you, are you repeating the same thing over and over again to someone until they believe you? Are you are, how, how, what does that mean when you say missionary work to have my value proposition understood? What well, does that mean? Um, in the energy management or energy efficiency world, uh, uh, much is, uh, is understood about, well, if I swap out this light for a more efficient light, it's very deterministic. I know what I'm going to get. Um, or uh, similar types of equipment-centric activity. The notion of using um, basically a business information system with mathematics and modeling uh, offering uh, you know, the insight that, uh, that it can, providing uh, the basis to act uh, and achieve energy efficiency through low cost or no cost actions, through behavioral change, through elimination of waste and that, that was very uh, new to the market here. And uh, you had, we had to do a lot of education uh, to uh, prospective customers. You know, the, the, the first question typically was, well, how does it work? And, and, and will it work? And so, and that to a certain extent can still occur in certain sectors, you know, but it's becoming more and more accepted. Some of the larger utilities have, have gotten behind it. Um, here in Ontario, the OPA has incentive programs that include the use of our technology. So it is growing now in its, uh, its uh, uh, 
traction. Your evangelizing work to the day. That's right. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's hard yeah. doing new things. Yeah, that's true. Rob, why don't you tell us about where, where you're at? Yeah, your... so there's, there's less on the education of our product being new because farmers are already using products to control their diseases. Um, our trick is to convince them to substitute what they're currently using for our product. Um, in the realm of clean tech, if you will, in agriculture, there's a little bit of a stigma in terms of, oh, it's clean. Yeah, maybe for organic farming, it, it might be okay, but is it gonna give me the return? Is it gonna give me the efficacy? So that's really the education for us is to overcome that stigma. Also, unfortunately, you know, some of the earlier launches of biologicals and agriculture kind of spoiled it a little bit. They overpromised, underdelivered. So for us, that's the educational part, just to kind of on that theme. But for us, in terms of our go-to-market, on the market part, uh, was really, um, to quote kind of Steve Blank, if you guys know about him and the whole sort of lean uh, business model and go-to-market strategy, is get out of the building. Get out of the building. And that meant going and seeing your customers from day one and understanding what do they need, what are the pain points. Because for us, we had a technology, so we had to figure out what are the priority markets that had the most need for our solution. And then from there, you go through sort of the typical, well, you do trials, and for us, you know, you're testing in a field, you're doing it with universities, you're doing it with private researchers. Once you're comfortable that you have the value proposition and the performance, then you go and test with growers and then you know, you're ready to rock, so. So have any of the three of you had to do what I would call a pivot? So that can either be a, a strategic pivot, that you know, my customers are different than I thought and the technology I have has a different application, or a pivot even in a deep design change. You know, I thought I was gonna use lithium ion and my batteries and now I gotta use zinc air or something. Mm -hmm. I wish you, I bet you wish it was zinc air, but um, <laughs> have, you, have, any, <laughs> yeah. have you had to do some pivots and, and, and talk about how, how that pivot worked and how it came about? If, or, if, or if no, just say none. It no. worked the first time. Uh, well, we certainly did um, because, as I said, the, the whole um, target at first was industrial. And uh, two things happened. I, I think it's fair to say that industrials are typically very sophisticated. They, they may have a lot of uh, systems and, and personnel who are attacking the energy problem. Um, so to sell to them uh, sometimes uh, was either a very long sales cycle or would result in a very quick, uh, you know, we don't really need what you're doing because um, we've got a lot of stuff on the go. So I guess the pivot really was to address other sectors. So not that we've walked away from industrial, we're still very active in industrial, but we've broadened to commercial, to retail, to the uh, mush sector, which is the, you know, the institutional hospitals, universities, schools, etc. And uh, it's not really changing the, the core thrust of what we do, but it was certainly broadening the market segments that we were looking at. Pivots, Rob? I think for us it was a matter of, again, we had a technology, uh, and we quickly mapped out sort of where all the different potential markets could be. The pivot was really around how we prioritize. So we quickly wanted to figure out, well, what are the one or two markets where we can demonstrate the most value? and pivoting to those, because the temptation is, well, there's 10 markets where there's some applicability, there's some value there, so how do you rank it? Because it's tricky when you're in front of, for example, our board, who are like, do all 10 at once. Well, that's not realistic, <laughs> nor is it smart. We really want to nail one or two right and then quickly expand into others. So that's, it's more, the pivot was really driving and understanding the need for a prioritization for us. I would say since I'm in a you know pretty new go-to-market situation, uh, we're not in that pivot situation the, quite yet. The but pivot is coming. Pivot, is coming. <laughs> pivot might be quite literal in that uh, we're probably going to make a, a folding version of the bike. So, um, but as far as um, you know, sussing out um, whether a pivot was necessary or, or what trajectory we were on, I did a lot of early research when I was in university, mapping out the, the landscape and the stakeholders and uh, proved that you know, to a certain degree we're still in the right direction and then had a lot of uh, you know, uh, real life uh, rider testing, probably at this point over close to 300 riders. And then uh, probably the last market intelligence effort was to uh, be on the Indiegogo campaign which, uh, which we launched in, in May. And uh, that brought back a lot of good uh, um, feedback from the, the web sphere and, and a lot of international feedback and, and where the product 
probably could apply and where people were, were not liking it. So, um, but you know, all indicators are sort of that we're in the right, right direction. Yeah, I find pivots really interesting because sometimes the entrepreneur fights that pivot because it's like you have to admit something was wrong or stop chasing something right. you've been so ardent about for so long. Yeah. And it feels like giving up, but a pivot can be some of the healthiest things that ever happen. The whole, all of a sudden, the veil drops and the markets emerge and so on. So. This can happen a lot with founders. Yeah, as right? a, as a, as, a, so as an ex-founder myself, that I can, they, yeah. they never want to see anything else. <laughs> That's right. Well, you, you you often don't want to because you can be distracted. You have to believe in what you're doing. Yeah. And so a pivot often means I have to change my beliefs, and it's hard to do, but it can be very very healthy. Yeah. So there's there's a there's a there's a pivot coming. There has to be. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so uh, how about uh, big corporates, friend or enemy? Uh, big corporates, friend or enemy? First, you give me a first response and why. I can start. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. No, I'm, are they this customer, is Mars. Are we, they customers is, or competition? Good They're question. both good for question. us. They're both. Right. Um, the way we think about it in our industry, the conventional chemical companies, there's five of them, they dominate sort of this area of making plants grow faster, increasing the yield. So they're starting to get into our space. They recognize the value. Agriculture has to change just given all these macro trends. Um, but for us to get leverage with the big companies, we are doing a lot of it ourselves. We wanted to prove the value in our target market, start selling, demonstrate that customers want it, show that we can actually increase the yields, do it price competitively, what they're currently doing, and then have the leverage to negotiate with them. Because the temptation, at least in our industry, is, oh, we have a technology, let's start early, maybe license it out. We just didn't think that we'd get the most value out of each of our technologies until we had some market traction. Mm -hmm. Chris. I'd say, again, uh, if they're customer prospects, they can, the, the, um, you know, the prize at the end could be huge, uh, but they tend to move very slowly. There never seems to be someone that you think can actually make the decision. And uh, the sales cycle can be so long with so many requirements that they can basically suck you dry uh, while you pursue the order, so to speak. Yeah. If they're competitors, um, they can be pretty threatening because, you know, they they bring the, you know, the weight of their organization. They are well known in the marketplace, and even if they don't really do what you do, they may be able to convince the the customer you're trying to sell to that hey, we do that. It's part of our overall portfolio. And then, frankly, they're an opportunity because if you do what you do very well and they don't have it then ultimately they may come along and say, okay, we like what you do and we may buy you. That would so. be, yeah. I would say for the most part, as far as uh, the e-bike um, marketplace, they've been, the big corporations have been uh, a friend. Yeah. Uh, reason being, uh, it's fairly recent technology. Um, China pretty much developed it in the, in the mid-90s, uh, sort of as a government imperative to, as a clean technology. And um, it's still a hard thing to get the message about what e-biking is, what the value proposition is. So that's where that kind of message and the de development of the supporting supply chains and products really has to come from the big corporations and, and developing those better products and getting that message out. And uh, at the same time, it, it's good for someone like myself who's uh, maybe a little more agile, maybe can, can kind of map out the landscape and try to find a little missing niche. And uh, you can react better and you can you know, because they're all kind of like, you know, lining up to build their their specific product sets, and they, you know, um, as as especially in the bike industry, they're always hungry for that little micro innovation. So, um, and that's been proven with a lot of uh, electric bike startups through Kickstarter and and uh, places like that. So it just shows that the two can coexist, and they don't have to cancel each other. Out, so, <laughs> <laughs> not yet, anyways. Um, the venture capital risk capital community in Canada. Good, bad, ugly. Ignore the fact that I run a venture fund. Tell me what you really think. How would you I, I may it? share your point of view. I mean, we, we <laughs> consider ourselves, you know, mavericks in the industry, but uh, but that's a, that's a serious question, right? Capital in this in this country is is crucial for technology companies. Mars is actively engaged in trying to loosen up and catalyze that that activity. Um, so uh, you know, I think it's a, it's an extremely important topic, and, and it's an mm -hmm. it's an evolving it's an evolving ecosystem too. So we don't have to point fingers, but in general, as a technology company going to market, you need capital. What is your experience here? Uh, we've not used VC funding. Okay. Um, we're funded primarily by 
friends and family, angels. Uh, there is some actually, you know, Mars has been involved in the early stage here as well as OCE. Um, I think Arson, you know, it, there isn't a lot of VC funding in Canada uh, as compared to south of the border. Uh, so it's good to hear that you're actively working to, you know, loosen it up and create more. Um, so um, we haven't had any direct experience with VC funding, okay. but uh, I know that there's a there's a dark side to it, um, you know, in terms of the what do you mean, <laughs> my son? <laughs> you know, they, yeah, they want did. everything they can get, and there's a you know, it's a very demanding uh, process. I'm sure you know a lot more about it. Than well, you I mean we're rational actors? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I take your point. It, right. it, it, it's, uh, it's a difficult dance sometimes. Yeah. And I think yeah. part of what happens is each side doesn't really, you know, yeah. want to understand the other side. And, and I think right. the, the Certainly, dance can, can work a lot better when, when I think, you... I uh, think, you know, the patience of the angels and friends and family is, is largely, is yeah. a lot greater yeah. Than, uh, yeah. than the VC yeah. world. Yeah, Rob? Yeah, I'd act, we also have not uh, used any VC funding. We, we're also, is that by choice or is that by? It's, we're lucky. We have a group of great, we also have, uh, we our first round was financed by angel investors. They get agriculture. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very patient. Uh, the timeline to market is probably uh, up there with respect to how long it takes in agriculture versus other industries because we're beholden to Mother Nature. I can't snap my finger and have a tomato plant grow overnight, unfortunately, for our testing. So it takes time. That would be technology. That would be technology. We're working on that. <laughs> That's phase two. That's phase two. Um, so they're they're very patient. Um, yeah, but I actually the the one point on financing that at least for us has been quite a boon is we happen to be uh, at an intersection of clean tech and agriculture, both priorities being in Canada. So we've just gotten a lot of grants. Um, and that's, I know, Mars's work with the funding portal, which is an awesome tool. I encourage everyone in this room, if you're an entrepreneur or you're in uh, a smaller organization, it's, it's a great tool to look for, for those types of financing options as well. Henry, you um, mentioned I, Indiegogo. Yeah, I also haven't uh, had to tap into VC funding uh, yet. Um, I'm probably the poster child uh, for how you can kind of ramp up uh, like us getting as many grants and, and prize winnings as possible. Lean and mean. Uh, lean and mean. Um, so basically, uh, my funding picture has been, um, you know, I started off obviously with my own money, but then uh, won a few design awards, a few business awards, and then also tapped into a lot of great resources like um, uh, Venture Start and the, uh, the OCE helped, helped out a lot with their market readiness. And... Uh, Sorry, I know I'm missing something else. There's a there, lot of props the, for yeah. Mars going on up here. Is this, a, this is not a plant. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, yeah. So I'm basically um, going on, uh, still, still going through those funds right yeah, now. And yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to run as lean as I can as well. Yeah. As you evolve, I mean, scale will come, right? So right. I, I know that, yeah, Rob, there's a lot of demos going on, but there's mm -hmm. going to be scale issues. And, and when you go into production, there's going to be scale issues. And sure. there, I think you're going to grapple with different financing questions, different issues, right, that are, that are all going to sort of loom. So there's, there's sort of the normal problems in starting and developing a business, right? Finding capital, finding the first customer. Quitting your job is often a big barrier sometimes. Yeah. Um, to tell me something, that, an unexpected barrier or an unexpected challenge that you faced in the last little while and, and maybe what you learned from that. <laughs> I can start. Um, Tom and I were talking a little bit about this. I think part of it is the nature of agriculture, but I'm sure there are other analogous industries out there, is generation divide. Uh, specifically, our unexpected or my unexpected challenge is talent um, in, in the sense that agriculture is, for the most part, a very slow-moving industry. So you have the majority of the technical expertise housed in Gen X and before. I'm Gen Y, other people, we're trying, the, what we're trying to do is trying to be a bit disruptive in agriculture. So the ideals and what drives us is very different, we found. So we need that technical expertise, but we also need at the same time for them to believe in the ideals, to want to work at a smaller company that's trying to do something quite different than what's been done in, for 50, 60 years in terms of growing food, so. Yeah. I certainly agree with the talent. Uh, point. I mean, great talent is uh, is vital. Uh, finding it um, is uh, always a challenge, particularly in certain. Uh, we benefit by being in Waterloo, so there's a great 
pool of talent relative to mathematics, engineering, computer science. That's not nearly as challenging, perhaps, as, um, as finding great sales uh, people and marketing mm -hmm. people. Um, for us, maybe w one of the unexpected things was, um, you know, energy is just frankly still too cheap uh, <laughs> in North America. It, it may sound uh, strange for me to say that, but... Not to me. <laughs> not to you, right? Um, but. It, with electricity prices and natural gas prices where they are, um, it, you know, sometimes the, the biggest issue is it's not painful enough for companies to want to reduce their spend in energy and, uh, and adopt new methodologies for energy efficiency. If uh, electricity prices were to rise dramatically and also natural gas and all that, you know, that would be more of a forcing function for what we do. Now, is your market in, is primarily in Ontario, but you have, you no. mean, you have a North American view, and yeah, you can, you can hunt the low-hanging fruit, right? That's I mean, right. We're yeah. right across Canada and into the U.S., and, but you know, generally speaking, power in North America is much less uh, expensive than it is other places in the world, so it, which obviously we would like to pursue. <laughs> Price on carbon. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. And unexpected challenge that you might have faced? Well, um, for me, it's, it was really since I'm still at the you know probably product development stage. It yeah. has a lot to do with uh, finding uh, resources to put the supply chain basically to put the bike together. Uh, there's a lot of custom parts, and so I had to um, basically find the right talent to make the frame, uh, machine these parts. So there's a bit of a challenge there because it's that was all brand new to me, and, and I don't I don't maybe I haven't tapped into the right channels to make you know, all those engineering and fabrication um, connections that, that make things a lot easier. And also, um, a lot of the parts come from China because they basically have uh, created the market and created the products. So uh, one of the unexpected uh, things there was uh, the cost of uh, shipping and uh, some of the, the tariffs, some of that, that happened, you know, um, those surcharges when you get it. So it ends up that when you're, especially when you're prototyping, you're ordering small quantities that Basically, what you think is a certain price, sometimes it just basically is doubled, which is, which is sort of a complaint I hear about people trying to bring industry back. Um, and then one of the reasons, actually, to bring industry back is that, that uh, the cost of shipping goods and, and doing business overseas you know, is, start, is starting to get more expensive. Yeah, yeah. What's the worst mistake you've ever made as an entrepreneur? Worst mistake. We've all made mistakes. I mean. Um, Go ahead. It's just hard finding. It's just hard. <laughs> it's just hard finding the worst one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. There's I mean, there's just there's a plethora. I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I Entrepreneurs think, make mistakes. If you don't make a mistake, you're not doing anything. That's right. You're not so, learning. Yeah. Um, I got a well, kind of a funny story for myself. It's really not so much about being an entrepreneur, but it's about networking. Um, I think I was getting a bit over my head about what I knew about the industry. And uh, I think I made myself look a bit like a bit of an ass one time when I was networking, having a bit too much uh, networking drinks, and and talking to <laughs> talking to uh, CEO of an energy company, and uh, he made a reference to something in the industry uh, that was going on in the industry. I thought I knew better, and I kind of shot down his idea. So I would say, if you're networking, just make sure you say nice things to everybody. So I would oh, say that was come my, on. No, no, no. <laughs> were, you, were you right or wrong when you shot down his idea? Um, polite or impolite? You know, the thing is, you just have to be a little bit more, I think, a little more uh, correct. Yeah, a little more tactful. And I think at the time, I was just so excited to be in the space of, of being the entrepreneur and, and networking to start off that I think uh, that's probably something that came to mind. Yeah, yeah fair <laughs> Rob, I think for I think for us, at least early on, like we have a board of directors that has been really helpful, and I think we just on the mistake point, we were very reticent to share our setbacks with them, versus what we do now is that's we have a board meeting tomorrow. We always talk talk about our setbacks first. It's almost a 180 because it's almost a cult. We want to build a culture of making sure that we, I know it sounds weird, but embrace our failure. So we all understand that, hey, we had setbacks, but obviously what are the lessons? What can we do differently? How can we pivot or make a course correction or do things differently next time? And not hiding them. I think we, we, we did that at the beginning, and I think that, that was a mistake because 
you know, certain things came out, and then it just, you know, then you're playing catch up versus being very upfront and actually, you know, being very proactive about how to deal with it. I haven't heard anything yet slightly embarrassing yet. <laughs> All right, we'll put a hold on that, okay. Chris. <laughs> um, well, I, a couple of things come to mind. I certainly, I invested, uh, you know, over a year in the pursuit of a, of a huge, huge deal, uh, which would have been fantastic. Um, and I uh, actually had a verbal on it. So that's, uh, you know, it all felt good at the time. And then back to the point about these large companies, are they, are they good or bad? Mm -hmm. This was a, an absolutely huge company. And, um, you know, the effort, the energy, and the time, and despite the verbal, didn't end up producing anything. Uh, we got, we thought we were at the goal line and, uh, and then all, everything just kind of went like this because they said, well, you know what? We don't really have the bandwidth to do this right now, so, so we're not going to. Wow. And, and we're, well, 15, oh, I've got 15 months worth of effort down the drain. Yeah. So, Is they, it, do you find it's a different business culture doing business in Canada or doing business in the United States? Um, yeah, it's different. I mean, I've lived and worked on both sides of the border. I spent nine years living in Phoenix, and uh, so um, there is a difference. Uh, there's also a lot of common ground there, but... Uh, what are some of the differences, do you think? Um, it, the, the U.S. tends to be a lot more aggressive, I would say, um, regardless of which side of the table you're on. Uh, whether you're trying to sell something or whether you're trying to buy something. Um, the U.S., uh, very aggressive. Um, it's, a, it's a market designed to encourage that and, and, and rewards aggressive, successful behavior very much so. It's a little less uh, that way here, I'd say. You know, just um, I don't want to say it's... Um, there aren't a lot of aggressive Canadian companies, but the, the way people go about their business is a little different. I don't know whether anybody here, yeah. you, no, you've, I, you've spent a lot of time in the US. So yeah, it's, that's... It's litigious. Well, it's very litigious, yeah, no question about that. Yeah, yeah I, I would definitely echo that, and I guess a corollary is the risk takers. Yeah. They're just a lot more tolerant of taking risks. One very interesting observation, <laughs> I don't know how many people are in, in agriculture in here, probably not very many, but just registering a product in Canada versus the US is just, it's very telling. In Canada, there's a laundry list of not only does it work, is it safe, multiple years of trials, whereas in the US, I don't want to say that it's a lot more lax, but also it's more of a buyer beware culture. Let the market figure it out. Mm. So that, I think is a really good example, just kind of exemplifying yeah. what you're saying is much more, let's kind of let the consumers determine what the best solutions are and uh, not have sort of, in this case, government tied up. Um, I can't say I've had a lot of experience differentiating the two markets. I mean, it, uh, for me, it's a matter of scale as far as mm, electric scale. bikes are, are yeah. concerned. And uh, as a result, they can, they can sustain um, a larger mix of products and and uh, just have bigger companies. But as far as my experience with, with uh, supply chain, um, I found that if I, if I you know, from, from a point of view of uh, getting product uh, from either Canada or the US, I find that in terms of reaction and shipping and all that, that sort of thing, uh, the American companies have generally been a lot faster mm. and a lot more responsive. So. Good. So in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to go to the audience for questions. So do start thinking of them now. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll go to you and give you a chance to ask questions in a moment. Um, if there were to be some more supports for entrepreneurs, if there were to be more supports for entrepreneurs, and maybe just say it's fine, we don't need any, and, you know, just go do it. If there were to be more supports for entrepreneurs in Canada, what would those supports be? I mean, is it getting access to export markets? Is it, uh, I mean, because for one, I mean, again, there's three very different kinds of companies here. Um, and clean tech as a whole is often very different from IT because it's utility based. Even if it's not building in big infrastructure, it's selling into an environment that deals with big infrastructure, deals with agriculture. In your case, it's a little bit different. But in general, clean tech has some pretty big you know, uh, folks to wrestle down. 
Um, so perhaps from that context, we might uh, answer mm -hmm. this question in terms of the kinds of supports for entrepreneurs. Yeah. I know I'm, that's a very leading question now, isn't it? I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to be having ideas. I'm supposed to be asking you for your <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Forget I said all that. You can, you can voice your ideas too, Tom. <laughs> what kind of supports, additional supports, if any, well, should be around for entrepreneurs in, in Canada? What are, we, what are we missing? Well, certainly funding is, is a big one, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and there, is, there are funding mechanisms available. Um, if I just uh, bring it into Ontario for a moment, you know, the, the OCE is a tremendous uh, resource, and I think they, you know, they're spending about $50 million a year. Um, you know, I, I'd love to see that be bigger, mm -hmm. especially for clean tech and, and green energy, if you like, particularly when the province has a stated mission to be a world leader in renewables, green energy, smart grid. Mm -hmm. um, the whole thrust around smart grid here in Ontario, um, you know, is, is admirable and is certainly n well understood on the world stage how Ontario is trying to... Uh, uh, push ahead here, but you know, it, it more would be better. Um, so that would be one thing on the funding. And then secondly, um, I've been on some very good trade missions. So we we did a trip to Silicon Valley a couple of years ago, and uh, were basically showcased as part of uh, a group of leading Canadian innovative companies in smart grid uh, technology. And uh, that was tremendous. I mean, we got, you know, toured around the valley for a couple of days. Great, great companies to meet with. More of, and there are many of those. Uh, some of them are, you know, less doable than others. But uh, that kind of door opening is, mm -hmm. is wonderful for Yeah, the Canadian consulates like do good yeah. work. DFATE yeah. is, a, is a good partner. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Rob? I, I echo the funding. I mean, it's well known there's this chasm of, sort of options post ideation proof of concept that you might get funding if it comes out of a university or you're doing early stage research, but you're not yet in the market so you can't tap like debt or maybe it's even too early for VCs. But for example, you know, SDTC is a great organization that we've gotten funding for. They focus just on that chasm. So that's great. So from a funding perspective, I guess from an advisory perspective, I think there's a lot of focus on early stage, meaning hey, I'm trying to write a business plan, trying to get some seed money, but what about after? What about the stages leading up to commercialization? I'd like to see a little more meat around what those advisory services could look like. Obviously, not a little biased, but I love Mars. So we work with the clean tech group. We also work with Bio Enterprise in Guelph, which is more ag specific. So that's great, but even those two groups, I'll say, very good at the early stage, but what about shepherding those companies that make it through and being more specific about what the supports could be like, for example, corporate governance? How do we connect good advisors to these organizations that are ready for it? That's just one example, but I think middle to later stage, as you're ready to launch, having more sort of business advisory around that. Yeah. Um. My perspective is a little bit different, uh, especially coming uh, from an industrial design background, trying to make a product. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got two university degrees, one from way back in the 80s, and then one recently at the Ontario. The 80s? Code. Yeah. But we won't Seriously? Go there. But, um, <laughs> Are you kidding me? The landscape is quite different now. Um, <laughs> I've had the good fortune of kind of uh, having steps to, <laughs> to entrepreneurship. Uh, <laughs> can we just we'll, we'll uh, move on? on. We moved on. So, uh, <laughs> so anyways, the point is, um, point is, I, I've been fortunate to kind of uh, have my my path through entrepreneurship kind of uh, laid out a little bit better than when when I was first in university. So, for example, um, on, on Ontario College of Art uh, and Design University, they've got now an imagination catalyst, and a lot of these universities now have these uh, springboards for for new um, entrepreneurial development. Oh, yeah. And then within, I would say within two square kilometers, we've got Mars, we've got OCE. So I've been, I've had a good support mm -hmm. network just within the city of Toronto. Um, now, but what I see as a gap is, um, from my perspective, is as far as, you know, want to bring back manufacturing technology back into, to, uh, you know, because uh, we've been outsourcing so much for the years, is we kind of depleted a lot of that uh, manufacturing base and, and knowledge. So where I see um, a lot of startups are on the digital sphere, um, the ecosystem is very well groomed for that, right? Like we've got a lot of these incubators for, for digital technology, but 
if you want to make something, um, mm. there isn't a parallel mm. uh, sort mm. of environment for that. So what would be great is some sort of really high-tech maker space where yeah. people like myself could sort of share ideas and kind of you know, encourage idea. each other. Yeah, yeah. things, not yeah. apps, right? Things. Yeah, right. yeah that's, a, that's a really good idea, actually. We'll have to... <laughs> Let's talk offline about that. That's a really good one. Um, so you all play a leadership role in your organizations. You know, and entrepreneurs, even when the company gets big, you, 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 know, there's, you have teams around you, but you're kind of the head of the ship. When you want to talk things out, I mean, no one likes being a lone soldier. Uh, how do you talk, who do you talk them out with? How do you, how do you find a peer network? Or, I mean, your friends don't want to hear about all your CEO problems over, the, over a beer, so that runs tired after a while. How do you find a peer group to sort of discuss the unique problems that a CEO faces. I mean, what do you, what do, you do about that? How do you, how do you, or do you? I do. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've got a vehicle there. Um, my chairman, uh, you know, we talk regularly. Um, and by extension, the board that we have. I mean, we've got a tremendous board of directors uh, who are all major investors in the company as well. So they've got uh, a lot of skin in the game. Um, and they've got just a tremendous wealth of experience. So they're not a passive board by any stretch. And um, they can really uh, are a tremendous resource for, you know, let's talk strategy. Let's discuss the current situation we're in. Uh, uh, you know, your point about pivot. Uh, you know, should we pursue this direction or that direction? So it's, it's, uh, it's a board worthy of a Fortune 500 company, and I just happen to be uh, blessed with it on, a, on an early stage uh, small company like we have. So mm -hmm. it's a tremendous resource. Um, probably, um, you know, uh, has been extremely beneficial as we've come along the journey, so to speak. Yeah. It's funny, as a CEO, my, my relationship, my initial relationship to a board was one of, of, of uh, not combative, but yeah. I didn't want to hear about it. I didn't become yeah. a CEO to listen to anybody. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was young then. Yeah. <laughs> it was in the 80s. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Uh, I didn't but, think there were many on the panel here that could relate back to the 80s, Tom. But, oh, we could uh, do a sing-along The color later. of your hair and mine, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that's really, so, so, I, I, so let's go, let's hear more about uh, peer groups and how we talk about issues leaders face and, and do boards play that role or, or, or how, are, how does that work? The board is huge for us. Is it? Um, we were very strategic in, in thinking about our board. I mean, I'm sure like a lot of startups our initial board were basically investors, but we were very, uh, we tactfully think, thought about, well, we need industry expertise. No one here knows anything about agriculture, and we're running an agriculture company, so it's kind of it's a running joke for the first few board meetings, but bringing on industry expertise, and then also just making sure that there's a really diverse point of view, points of view on, on the board, and sometimes actually mm -hmm. assigning people to play the contrarian. Uh, which is what we've actually actively done, uh, just to make sure that you know there's not you know your group think whatever. So definitely the board for for me, I just look for kind of my mentors from previous lives. So there's a prof that I stay in close contact with from university. There's a couple of people from Bain. So I, I that's also good because it's different perspectives. Obviously, they're not all they're not in our industry. Uh, they may not even necessarily have a lot of entrepreneurial background, but just using them as a sounding board and having different voices, I think, is, is useful. So that's what, that's what we've done. Henry. Um, well, I've been very fortunate because I've, I've tapped into probably every resource I could find. So uh, starting off with university, we had some uh, business advisors at, at the Imagination Catalyst. And then uh, I found uh, Murray McCaig was my first advisor from, from Mars. And then uh, another great advisor I've had since uh, pretty much inception was uh, Lisa Haroon. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, some uh, business developers at the OC. And then, really, when you start, you know, I mean, my, my decisions are not as probably as great as, uh, as uh, these other companies. But, um, you know, still, you know, we still have to make strategic decisions. But when, when um, you're looking for advice, it can come from, you know, your, your friends. But when you're a startup, your friends who have, you know, started their own businesses and are more entrepreneurially minded, if you leave yourself open, they're always, you know, a lot are very excited to just take you out for a drink and tell you about your business, you know, and you just have to listen. And then there's uh, sort of things, um, 
you know, I've come from an entrepreneurial family, so, um, so I, you know, there's, there's advice from my sisters. Uh, my, my sister Mary is uh, uh, basically my business partner. And then there's the, the support of friends. And then my wife Marika is, is a great uh, confidant in making those last minute decisions. Uh, and she's been a great support. So yeah. uh, I'm just open to get it uh, wherever. But then, you know, obviously you have to distill it down and, and just go with your gut on a lot of big decisions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why don't we go to the audience to see if there's some questions for our entrepreneurs from the audience. There's two mics. There's one there and there's one there. I would ask you, uh, introduce yourself, but don't give us a long statement and make us have, have a question. <laughs> I've been guilty of that too, so. <laughs> Sir. Okay. My name's Peter. Thank you for the panel for great questions. The moderator gave you one on unexpected barriers. Have any of you encountered unexpected aha moments or events that have put your product or services out front. And I've got a, a quick example for each of you. Uh, Henry, uh, City of Toronto, in spite of the car loving counselors not wanting to do this, downtown businesses want a lot of bike uh, stations for parking the bikes and quick showers and stuff like that. Robert, uh, your traditional agra chemical competitors hold the biggest smoking gun for the elimination of bees and other pollinators. Do you have a product that counters that? Chris, uh, the effect of uh, climate change in terms of clean tech and how that impacts uh, your analytics and big data analysis. Well, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> actually, it is a huge opportunity. Um, as well as energy per se, we also do greenhouse gas emissions. So we do the modeling and analytics around that and can track and report greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, you know, were there an actual uh, carbon market or a, a, a greater uptake towards the importance of reducing carbon emissions and, and creating that, that um, infrastructure and market system, we'd, we'd see the benefit of that greatly. But today it's mostly a monitoring and, and reporting uh, requirement. Um, but if that were to ever evolve, we'd, we'd be, uh, you know, I think a famous guy once wrote this book, Kick the Fossil Fuel Habit. <laughs> and uh, you know, if we could ever get some of that to happen, we'd be away to the races, I think. Yeah, the bees question is, it's a tough one because there's, uh, to my understanding, there's a number of different reasons or hypotheses, I should say, as to why the bee population is dying off, which obviously has huge ramifications on, on agriculture. For us, we do have one technology in the queue which we think could be useful for one part of it, but in terms of the big smoking gun, I think you're referring to these insecticides that the big conventional companies push, which could be one of the big reasons. Uh, and we've seen that in our own backyard in terms of reports this summer. I think for us is, is actually being, taking active voice in lobbying. For us, it's through the Biopesticide Industry Association and pushing them to actually, A, take a deeper look and think about are there replacement products that could be maybe not as efficacious but obviously will not be as damaging, and B, investing. I mean, there's only so much we can do because we're, we're a small company, but for example, Bayer has done that. They've created a institute to look at specifically the bee problem, so that's what we've done. Um, I don't know if I have any, uh, I think, unexpected obstacles, smoking guns, is that, that, that was the question? No, it's the, opposite, the, the aha moments that actually will work in your favor. Oh, I see. Um, uh, sorry, I don't have a particular aha moment right now, but okay. Um, I know that one of the, the barriers that I was up against was that there's a uh, perception problem with electric bikes. Um, cycling culture is sort of like a, a very uh, sort of you know, ground level culture and they, they, you know, the bike lanes are very hot, highly contested territory and there's always a bit of controversy <laughs> about the place of electric bikes in that culture. So I would say, um, you know, I wanted to find out firsthand, um, there was Jennifer Kiesmat had organized some uh, uh, city rides, uh, public, uh, sort of public uh, uh, talks about the future of our infrastructure. And I decided to show up with my life bike and ride with a bunch of uh, cyclists, right, which I knew were a little bit more heavily politicized. And um, 
the aha moment was at the end of that ride, um, half of them didn't realize I was riding electric. And they, they just, I just ride among the group, and it just all blended in, which was, uh, to me, validation on what I was trying to do, make something that was a little more friendly to the whole culture and to the infrastructure. So. Sort of like being on a Honda in a group of Hell's Angels. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, and thank you for your, sharing your experience with us. My name is Maria Noor. I'm from, uh, from Aram. We are a small engineering company. We are providing uh, services for swimming pool uh, water treatment system that we try to eliminate chlorine as much as possible. And uh, one of the challenges that we have is that we don't have access to a well-equipped uh, lab that we can do the testing. We have a small lab, but it's not uh, fully equipped. And I was wondering if in the process of developing your idea and your product, you had this problem, and what did you do with it? How did you solve it? Thank you. Green Center. Doesn't Green Center have a lab that's uh, available <clears throat> on an advisory basis? Come to Mars. Talk to an advisor. We will find you that lab. But anyway, the question is to... Is that for you? Uh, yeah, oh, Green Center's definitely one. <laughs> I believe they're, or they were affiliated with Queens, but yeah. look at universities. We've worked with several. Um, McGill, we've worked with U of T, we've worked with the University of Guelph. Those ones are more particular because they have a uh, bit of expertise in agriculture. So we've utilized them to do certain parts of discovery or run certain tests, which we don't have access to because you know the equipment is so expensive that we're not going to go and buy it to run a few tests, so we're going to outsource that. So, um, though our experience has been fee for service because they're one-off, but we're working with a couple of universities on more sort of. It's a little bit different. It's more on discovery, and there it's it's a different arrangement where we're not paying for their work. It's kind of a collaboration. Come and find an advisor at Mars. They will sit down and sort that out for you. Yes, sir. Actually, so this, I have a question for Robert. Um, the business you're describing kind of sounds similar to AgriQuest. I don't know if you've yeah. heard of them. Do you, is it actually similar? Do you work, compete against them, collaborate with them? Sure. If you could comment. Yeah, good, good, good question. So AgriQuest, uh, they, they're a competitor, but um, sorry, just I, I get it, I guess a bit bit of context for everyone. So they also focus on. Uh, pest control in agriculture, but they only introduce solutions that are biologicals. Another company that actually got listed on the NASDAQ a couple months ago is Marone Bio Innovations. Um, I don't really, they're competitors in the sense that there are certain target markets that overlap with us, but we see them as actually helping to propel biologicals forward as an industry as a solution, a very viable one for farmers. So we, we don't really view them as competitors overall. There, there's a little bit of overlap. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for coming out. I re I'm really appreciating these talks. Um, I've got several questions, and I'll address to each of you. Um, Henry, if you could talk a little bit about your Indiegogo experience, and uh, also uh, if uh, Tom or any of the other guys want to talk about uh, equity crowdfunding as a source for um, getting funding for projects. Um, Robert, have, what has been the, uh, your experience with GMO opposition, pushback, that sort of uh, space, or that type of question? And uh, same, Tom and Chris, um, you made a comment about uh, uh, electricity or energy prices aren't high enough yet. Uh, however, I, I would think that a lot of those people who are not in the industry, especially with all the uh, renewables that have been built up, there has been a big pushback against you know, the increase in, in price of electricity. Um, how do you combat that? Four in one, I love it. Wow. wow. Or three in one, four in one. Something Everybody like that. Great. That. They're all good questions. It's They're like all good a group questions discount. <laughs> so, somebody who remembers one of the first I ones answered. I first. remember the first question because <laughs> yeah. that was directed at me. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, as far as the Indiegogo campaign, um, our objective to get in there was to uh, make a sort of public pronouncement about the bike. It sort of had been sort of leaked out in, in various uh, means, but never officially launched in, on some platform. And I'd seen a lot of the successful, uh, you know, uh, products, in both Kickstarter and Indiegogo in the electric bike sphere. So I thought, uh, why don't we launch for Bike to Work Week? And uh, we even had a media event at Mars here. Now, uh, 
what we were really trying to do uh, was more for market intelligence and, and a little bit early marketing because we had enough funding to kind of get things started. So um, what I learned from that experience is uh, uh, we kind of tried to ram it through as sort of a lot of things that we were doing all at the same time. And I had my head down uh, doing a lot of product development work. So I wasn't really focused enough on the preparation for the campaign. And I would say if you're going to get involved in a uh, crowdfunding campaign, uh, one of the strategies is to prime your social networks and uh, uh, really get them, um, it's almost like doing a press release, but, but getting all your communications to your what you call your early community so that you can sort of get a, a fast run at, at getting some early funding and uh, so that, you know, as far as you, you look like you, you're, you're kind of getting on, um, traction right away from your early community. And we didn't do that. And so we were playing a lot of catch up as I, as I was going through the campaign. Um, but what it was really good for, I think, was um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, especially a lot of blogging on, on the e-bike space that they, they feed into a lot of these um, uh, crowdfunding sites for new, new innovation. And I got a lot of free media that way. And as, as a result, a lot of good market intelligence feedback. So um, I say if you think you're ready, uh, get, uh, definitely go for it. I think there's a question around GMO. Um, I could be here for hours, so I'll keep it really <laughs> short, which is, um, First of all, I mean, immutable factors, population growth, increasing caloric intake, arable land, fresh water required for agriculture is finite. Some can argue that they're decreasing in supply. So we got to produce more food with less resources. That's, that's just the end of the day. So GMOs, do they fit in there? I'm not going to share my personal opinion, but I will say that for our target markets, first of all, if you really, I don't mean to get technical, but GMO is really for weed resistance. Uh, some insects, we're focused on diseases, so more bacteria and fungi. So GMO seeds can't really be resistant to those. And even the weeds and insects, you're seeing it. You're dealing with living organisms and resistance creeps in. So there's only so long, there's, there is isn't finite life to GMO. It's not infallible, so. What's GMO? genetically modified seeds, I believe, or technology. Yeah. I asked that on behalf oh, of the sorry. audience. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. You want to take the energy Electricity, prices? yeah, yep. or uh, energy prices. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, the typical person on the street, um, and that's, uh, that's an important um, aspect of energy pricing, you know, may feel, wow, I'm already paying a lot of money for electricity and here in Ontario we have time of use pricing and if you don't pay attention and want to do everything in the middle of the day uh, you pay the peak rate. Uh, the, the, fa the actual fact is is that um, it is still you know low um, and uh, there is a case to be made for if not higher prices in general to have a bigger spread between off-peak and on-peak to encourage more conservation and more um, uh, reduction in, uh, in energy use. The, uh, the problem is it's a very politicized subject. And uh, anybody that follows the energy sector uh, here in this province will know that um, I don't know how many energy ministers we've had uh, uh, over the course of the last 15 to 20 years, maybe at least one per year. Tom, you might even know that number off the top ministers of your head. Ministers go to energy to retire? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the life expectancy of a minister of yeah, energy in Ontario is very short. Um, so the, the, you know, the issue is a, is a highly charged one. There is a, a very strong case to be made for higher energy prices to pay for the aging infrastructure, to pay for the investment we're making in renewables, uh, to help with the transition away from coal-fired plants. Uh, these are all good things. Um, then uh, the, the, the concern, and particularly again from the political viewpoint, is but what will this mean to the average consumer and the homeowner? and uh, you know, uh, is this going to be, um, uh, are we going to suffer repercussions because of it? So it's a, yeah. it's a tough one. I, yeah, Tom, I, mean, I don't, I don't advocate for higher energy prices in principle. I think we need a price on carbon. Um, climate change right. is coming. We're going off a cliff. 
it's difficult. And I, let's not go in there today. You know, you've, I've talked about that a lot. But to be clear, I, I want a, a, a heavy price on carbon to allow right. alternative technologies, essentially an even playing field, because you internalize the damage caused by the pollution of carbon dioxide. On the crowdfunding, now, I'm not an expert on crowdfunding. There are people at Mars who are. Adam Spence, the SVX people, these guys, they know a lot about crowdfunding. But funny you should ask, last night, I always kind of like, well, crowdfunding, I mean, I'm, I'm clean tech. I'm a serious, I, you know, it sounds like, you know, apps and stuff. I kind of had a breakthrough last night reading a, 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 a yet-to-be-published book by Jeremy Leggett from uh, Britain, who was characterizing crowdfunding long-term as being a way uh, a, 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 for the public to express the kinds of things they want their money invested in that pension funds and banks are too conservative to consider. Yeah. You know, whether it's a little bit of money or a lot, part of their retirement, they, you know, the, the, the institutions aren't making the kinds of decisions that they would make. I'll take a 5% return, just invest in a good future for my children or something like that. And I, and I realized the scale at which he was talking about crowdfunding. And I real, I, the light went out of my head. I literally, I wasn't an electric bike. I wish it was, because I could make this story really come together. But um, I was biking home, <laughs> pa being passed by electric bikes. <laughs> uh, it's excited, because I actually thought of one of our companies for whom I think crowdfunding would be, would be very useful. Um, now, you, you can't raise in Canada equity by crowdfunding, because there's accredited investor problems and you, know, you have a cap table problem, so you can't raise that. But you can pre-sell goods, so there's, there's ways around it. So I was trying to think, like, you know, what is it for this company I could sell the equity? And there's, you know, figuring out as an entrepreneur ways to do that. So uh, I, I would recommend anybody here who's thinking about crowdfunding um, to think about it and to come in, talk to the guys at the social finance group here at Mars. I don't have everyone at, email Adam Spence. He'll say, why did you say my name in front of so many people? I got 50, 50 emails, but <laughs> Adam <laughs> knows something about it. Um, so it's interesting. It's worth looking into. Uh, for the small stuff where you're pre-selling your first few you know, bikes and stuff, right up to, I think, project finance. I think I used to advocate for green bonds. This was a thing I talked about a lot. Um, Ontario government has just announced transit bonds. The feds are never going to go green bonds, but I, I, I suddenly realized this is a way to do a green bond. Um, but it, there's more to it than that. But I, I do think it is a, a way to think about money being raised for interesting projects, particularly in clean tech, to get around the deep conservatism of banks and allow the public to express what they want their money invested in. So I think it's a really neat idea. Um, we have 15 minutes. We have good. Another question. Yes. Hi, my name is Bien Pham, and I have uh, two questions for you guys. Uh, on the topic of uh, creative space, uh, where did you guys first uh, incubate your ideas? Creative space, where do you get your ideas? Uh, I'll answer that. I've, um, it just, a lot of it just comes from the things that I've been interested in all my life. I mean, I've, I've been a cycling commuter in uh, Toronto for 35 years, and, and my experience with, with the change of in infrastructure and uh, the emergence of clean uh, electric transportation, those sort of things really connected with me. And um, I've always got those ideas dancing in my head and how to come up with uh, problem solutions. Right, solutions to those problems. So, um, and then going back and uh, studying industrial design, and then being in a creative community, I think really just amped that up that much more. Yeah, I think I said at the the beginning. Uh, so the founder of our of our first technology has this back great background in industrial biochemistry, and a big foodie. So that sort of intersection uh, helps him come up with the formulation for for our first idea. Uh, let me just clarify. Just I'm, what I meant was like in terms of like uh, creative manufacturing space, like uh, oh. Uh, oh, like you know, like you know, you always hear about guys, you know, making things out of their basements, you know, like mm. Michael Dell and things like that. Uh, but sometimes there are certain things that uh, probably like for yourself, Robert, that you can't really mix a bunch of chemicals in mm -hmm. your basement. <laughs> 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 your homeland security will come and find you. Yeah. Uh, we. One of our partners, we use their manufacturing space. That's how we got started. So, so we did. We don't manufacture anything. We're a yep. software company. So. Uh, and my second question was um, uh, on your web page, Robert. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, you're looking to work with uh, technology developers. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's, that's part of the lean model that we're testing in terms of uh, building our product pipeline. One is. Um, and the big chemical companies, because they're slow moving and bureaucratic, they're not very good at in licensing and working with different partners, whether it's universities or small companies to, to partner with them to take their technologies and kind of 
make them explode, and that's what we're trying to do. So we work with companies in South America and Western Europe that have a proof of concept that we think is interesting, and that's one strategy that we're testing to build our product pipeline, because discovery in agriculture is a $100 million plus endeavor to get one active. We're not at that stage, nor do we think that we want to be that company. So that's one strategy that we're testing. Hi, I'm David. Uh, I work here at Mars also. But I have a question about labeling your companies as clean or green. And have you consciously done that? Did it work in your favor or against you? And, and maybe you could each just comment a little bit on you know, the perception of your investors or customers to, uh, to using those terms or whether you had to just leave that in the background. Really good question. Yeah. Does clean tech label help or hurt? Um, I would say it helps um, from several perspectives. Not that we ever actually you know, actively um, use the label clean tech, but you know, for uh, people that are tracking the space, be they possible investors or partner companies or industry analysts, um, the, the clean tech uh, label, you know, does fit us quite well. Um, we certainly um, get some, uh, some exposure to, those, to the right uh, people in each of those areas because of that. I don't think it's hurt us, uh, certainly, um, by positioning ourselves as that. There are, I mean, it's a pretty wide uh, space, clean tech. Uh, it, it, it straddles a lot of spheres, and so, we, we, when, we act, when we actually position ourselves specifically to audiences, we, we typically talk about you know, the intelligent use of energy and uh, things that line up with that. But as a sector moniker, I guess clean tech is, is pretty good for us. Just, uh, I think from an investor perspective, it helps a lot. There have been a lot of tailwinds in anything that can help uh, propel agriculture to produce more with less. So that's helped a lot to the AgriQuest point. They got bought out at 15 times revenue. Marone uh, IPO'd at 30 times revenue. These are crazy multiples, so there's a lot of tailwinds. So investors want to jump on that bandwagon. From a customer perspective, it's quite the opposite. I think I talked about it earlier. There's still, unfortunately, a little bit of a stigma that it's snake oil or, unfortunately, a lot of the clean technologies that came out in agriculture over-promised and under-delivered. So for us, it's, it's like bullet point number six in the discussion. <laughs> number one is, is, why is it better than what we're currently using? And then when you go down the list, oh, it's green. That's nice. <laughs> it's the honest truth. Yeah. Um, for myself, I don't think I need to tout the benefit of electric bikes, because the whole industry is doing that. Um, you know, I'm just piggybacking off that. But basically, the value proposition is that you have a motorized vehicle that emits zero emissions. Now, that, that's kind of the foundation of the, of the story. But uh, when I first was invited to this talk, I was thinking, well, am I really this uh, green company? I mean, I'm creating consumer product. And uh, here I am with uh, you know, Robert and Chris who are doing things at more of a uh, macro level. I'm doing things at a more of a micro level. What I'm trying to do is, is give um, consumers greater awareness of, of electric transportation. I'm a big proponent that, of electric transportation as I'm sure we all are here, but we're sort of waiting for the big companies to sort of do things for us, make these electric cars, come up with this uh, you know, transportation infrastructure. But there's gaps in our, in our uh, transport system that we can fill uh, using technologies that are at our disposal. And your, your first access to clean electric transportation is probably going to be an electric bike, unless you've got you know, $80,000 for a Tesla or something like that, right? So um, yeah, I would say as far as uh, I have no problems talking about the green side of it because I'm a big believer in it. And um, you know, really, clean tech is not, um, is not really just a technology. It's actually bringing it back to the users because you guys are clean tech. If you're not behaving in a clean tech way, we have no clean tech. So it's a matter of um, changing habits and behaviors and, and, and bringing new solutions. And, and so I have no, bro no problems um, talking about the conversation from that perspective. Tom, if I could just interrupt oh, very quickly. We yes, do you have can. a question from one of our webcast participants. Uh, Chris and Robert mentioned the challenge of finding and hiring top talent. Do you think the federal immigration policy for skilled foreign workers is adequate? 
How can it be improved? Is there, is there something that people in the entrepreneurial space, such as Mars, are working on? Talent, immigration policy? Um, well, I don't know that we've been directly affected by, by that. I mean, we actually have uh, you know, quite a diverse workforce uh, and a lot of um, people that have emigrated to Canada uh, have been, are in our uh, team, either in software development or in, uh, in uh, energy analyst functions. So I think on a broader basis, uh, if a, I don't know whether this is going to come up uh, from Robert or, or Henry, but if, uh, if there were different policies, uh, would they you know, benefit? I can't, like, philosophically, the answer is yes. I think uh, you know, we shouldn't be restrictive if top talent is available uh, and wants to come and work in Canada and can be, and can be uh, directly applied to the problem at hand, I think it's a great, great idea. Yeah, I don't know if, they, if I have too much to add to that. We, uh, our talent issue is, or what we've done differently is moving away from relying on things like, or services like headhunters. We've just invested more ourselves. Um, to really go and do it, and we found it a lot more impactful because when prospective candidates hear from the company versus a third party, that is just a lot more attractive, we found, in terms of sourcing uh, interesting candidates. And we just learn a lot as well in terms of what our value proposition is to you know, people out there. So, Great. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to that. I mean, um, you know, um, I would say, as far as the more modern technologies that, that uh, my business requires, some of the uh, you know, uh, digital media type of stuff, I mean, there's more than an Apple talent pool here. And uh, as far as entrepreneurship, education, and support, I, I, I found that you know, uh, very strong here. I would say it comes down to the actual core manufacturing uh, skills. I would say that that's probably where I had a harder time sourcing for, for that. Great. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I'm Cyril. Uh, I'm going from Europe, as you can hear, and I'm very interested in by sustainable technologies. My background is IT. I'm trying now to use my skills for like maybe helping people like you. And um, I worked for big banks or like big marketing companies. I just figured out that these companies are very efficient, like using marketing. It's like terrible machine, you know, and you. You talked about GMO, and maybe we have all in mind a big company that like keep seed. Uh, you know what I mean? And um, like I travel a lot, and uh, I met people like farmers or agro engineers, and I feel like they are almost everywhere, but very, you know, not very strong against this terrible machine, you know. And um, I would like to ask you for you working in like sustainable technologies, what are the biggest obstacles to speed up like maybe a change, you know? Or what could be uh, like, if you could create um, a nice solution like in a minute, what could be like a good solution or what do you need to speed up this change? <laughs> I think he was directing me. All me, okay. Um, first of all, I think the company that potentially you're dancing around is Monsanto. And I'll say that they've actually made some strides to move into, it's funny you brought up IT. If you followed, they bought Climate Corporation for just over a billion a couple months ago. And they're using big data to help, well, their, their current service line is around selling insurance but really, they have the data to tell you on this plot based on all these climate variables that obviously farmers nor any of us can predict, they're able to, with all the historical data, soil, uh, moisture levels, humidity, precipitation, et cetera, tell you what your yield is within a very defined range and what to plant and what not to plant. I think there's an awareness that it has to change. I, I guess to part of your question in terms of what's the one thing I would want to do if I were to snap my fingers is kind of uh, 
change the mindset a little bit of the farmers on the ground to be more open to embracing things like that. I think you're seeing it because there's no choice. But, you know, for example, our technology, instead of taking, you know, three seasons of data to convince a farmer to, you know, use our product, maybe it takes two or one. Things like that, I think. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, um, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, one more question for Robert, actually. I just wanted to see if uh, your company has given any thought to uh, doing vertical farming, aquaponics, aeroponics. You mentioned a couple of times climate change, increased population. If you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, we're really focused on just disease control. So our technologies are just for disease control. So we don't, that's all we're playing in right now. We're really just focused on nailing that. So each take 30 seconds, what would you give our aspiring entrepreneurs or our existing entrepreneurs, uh, both, as closing advice? I'll start. Um, it sounds very basic, but do something you're really passionate about, because I found entrepreneurship being much more time consuming and, and mind consuming than I originally anticipated. So uh, make sure you do something you really like. You're here. My advice, which ties into the embarrassing moment, because uh, I have an example. <laughs> We've come now. back to that. I <laughs> it love it. It took me that long. No, there's a lot. I just had to <laughs> sift through when I was comfortable sharing. But stretch, like really stretch outside your comfort zone. You'll, you'll surprise yourself. Um, my example of that is we're working in farming. I was stressed like this on my first sort of farm road show. I was touring <laughs> rice paddies dressed like this. And, it's very uncomfortable, but now I've learned the lingo and the dress, and that was a bit of a stretch because I didn't come from that world. But really, really push yourself to stretch. You'll be surprised. Chris? Uh, I would say, um, you know, if you have an idea that you're very, very passionate about and uh, you, you, you believe that to be the case, uh, take the opportunity with uh, trusted advisors or seasoned veterans with some battle scars to uh, really um, uh, verify it and uh, you know devil's advocate it you know you're going to want to need to know that what you've got is real and then put all the wood behind the arrowhead and go for it if, if, uh, if you get that validation. Put all the wood behind the arrowhead. Oh, he's a poet. You like that one? <laughs> I love that one. You can use that one, Tom, if you want. <laughs> I'm going to. So I'd like to uh, join me in thanking our panel for being very generous with their time and their ideas. <laughs>